I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians, gee, that's an important word, isn't it? Custodians of the land on which I am recording this podcast, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters, and culture. I pay my respects to their elders of the past, present, and emerging. Hello and welcome to Unstress. My name is Dr. Ron Ehrlich. Well, if you're listening to this, you're listening, you're, you're a user of digital technology. Now, when I was growing up, digital technology involved the five fingers I had on each hand and my how things have changed. Um, everything with a screen on it is now really re uh, regarded as digital technology and we are surrounded by it. I mean, one estimation, as you will hear today, is that the average household has 17 devices that give it access to the digital world in each household. And when you think that many of us grew up with just one television and three stat for four stations, uh, that is quite a development, quite a challenge, in fact, and not just a challenge for our kids, for our adolescents, but for every single one of us. And, I, and I've often said that I think the biggest challenge for parents in this coming uh, decade will be how to manage technology and teach our kids and ourselves how to deal with it. We are like sweets in a kid, uh, kids in a sweet shop, sorry. For, and uh, and uh, we just haven't worked out how to control this, this amazing tool we have in our, in the, literally in the palm of our hands. And it is an amazing tool. It can be used in such constructive ways. Well, today we're going to explore digital nutrition, digital superfoods, and, and how to deal with uh, the digital world we find ourselves in. My guest today is Jocelyn Brewer. Jocelyn has been a psychologist for over 10 years and runs a boutique private practice in the inner west of Sydney, Australia. She works individually with adolescents and adults, as well as with families and parents across a range of mental health and life challenges. She has training in cognitive behavioral therapy, acceptance and commitment, uh, and family therapy. And her expertise is around helping individuals and families manage their technology use and preventing and treating internet addictions. Looks, it's a wonderful conversation I have uh, with Jocelyn. I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with Jocelyn Brewer. Welcome to the show, Jocelyn. Thank you. Lovely always to um, get the opportunity to chat. Well, Jocelyn, I've been looking forward to this conversation for quite some time because we're dealing with a topic that, God, to say it affects each and every one of us is an understatement if ever there was one. And, and at the risk of outlining obvious things, I thought, mm -hmm. I wonder if we might just start with technology, sort of an, an, an audit. How does technology connect us? What are the good things and what are some of the challenges that disconnect us? Sure. And look, technology has been around for a long time. We can think of pens and pencils as technology. So yeah. when we start thinking about digital devices and digital technology, especially in probably the last 10 to 15 years, since, you know, people like Mark Zuckerberg and even before him came up with things like MySpace and ways to connect. So the connection absolutely is one of the really positive things and it's the active connection. So it's the ability to reach out and share and kind of have those conversations. Um, I remember going to the Powerhouse Museum when I was in year three in 1986 and then talking about video phones. And then, you know, that was actually a thing. And so, you know, in, in the middle of Sydney's big lockdown, we can imagine that that's active connection. But then some of the ways the disconnection happens, I guess, is when we get really passive with things. So we sort of scroll mindlessly. We kind of feel like we know what's going on in people's lives because we've seen the photos or we've seen their kid having a swimming lesson in the bath that, you, you know, I shared the other day. <laughs> We're at that stage of lockdown. Um, you know, so it's really about how we use technology. It's not the fact that pretty much 97% of the Australian population have a device in their, you know, in their hands. I think it's on average 17 devices in every Australian home, but it's how we're thinking about using it and how we're conscious when we're using it. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you talk about uh, digital nutrition mm -hmm. and the nutrition is something I've been interested in for over almost 40 years. And yeah. I've always thought that calories were a pretty poor measure of nutrition. And, and I think I've heard you say time's not a particularly good measure either. What, what do you, what's a good, what, tell me about digital nutrition. Sure, sure. So digital nutrition is not an app which you, you know, plug in how many apples you've eaten or how much kale or anything like that. It's really just using all of those years worth of work in, in public health spaces that we've done on what is healthy eating to try and then buddy that up with how what we consume using technology can influence us and can impact the way we think and the information that we have, all of those sorts of um, things. So my kind of philosophy here is about um, it being proactive and really positive that, yes, there's calories as a, a particular metric, but if we sit down, we don't actually look at the calories on our plate. We would usually look at the, the nutrients and the protein and the fats and the sugars and all of those other things. So my invitation to people is not to have to use a you know learn a whole other way of thinking about technology, but buddying that up on on what we do know about what is you know healthful eating, um, and that comes in lots of different shapes and sizes. But generally, there's some principles that we can think about. So I do sort of say that our focus on screen time has been like a focus on just digital calories. And really, we should be thinking about things like virtual vitamins. So vitamin C for creativity, vitamin E for empathy, play being like a protein, a building block for how we learn. The first way that we start learning is through play, that social play, parallel play, and then, you know, playing together, all those sorts of things. Um, and this is probably why games are one of the things that young people especially um, gravitate to because it, it, it is so playful and it builds in all of these other virtual vitamins, um, you know, self-determination theory of feeling connected and competent and in control, um, which kind of is why games to some people are, are, you know, some people call them addictive, you know, inverted mm -hmm. commas there. Um, we'll probably talk about whether or not that's, that's technically correct. Um, yeah, so just... Thinking about, um, I guess, I guess the whole analogy came from this rise of digital detoxing and the idea that you know you had to detoxify from technology, as opposed to maybe you just needed to consume really um, consciously. Hmm. It's interesting to take that metaphor further because we've dealt with nutrition a lot on this program, and in my book and stuff like that. But I, I just uh, always refer to it as being the key overriding principle is for it to be nutrient dense. Absolutely. Yeah. And contributing to, you know, our values and being um, sort of aligned to the things that really matter to us. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I guess there's so many calories out there, right? And it's in, in modern society, few of us are really going hungry. It's about choosing the right kinds of things that support our well-being. Um, and the information that supports our well-being in a, you know, a world that I think there's that great saying, we're um, drowning in information, but we're starved for wisdom. Yes, yes. Well, one of our bylines is converting information to knowledge, yeah. um, because, uh, you know, that seems to be the biggest challenge of all. Um, I always, yeah, and still staying with this metaphor of technology and nutrition, because I really feel that we are like uh, kids in a sweet in a, in a sweet shop mm -hmm. uh, with technology. Even after fifteen years, I mean, I think two thousand and seven was a, a major mm -hmm. turning point with uh, smartphones and Facebook and all of that. Um, but we're like kids in a sweet in a in a toy shop or a sweet shop, mm -hmm. and we haven't quite learned as adults or children to fully be able to determine what's good for us and what's not. And I know addiction comes up as a word. And what, how do you define digital addiction? Well, it's a really good question. Um, I, how long have you got on that one? Because I think what's happened with the word addiction is it's become a um, shorthand for anything that's a bit of a guilty pleasure or something that we know is maybe not aligned to the things that really matter. And so when we talk about clinical addiction, um, something like the DSM, doesn't even use the word. In fact, it has a whole chapter at the start of DSM or a whole paragraph, sorry. Well, remind our listener of what DSM is. Oh, sorry, I'm... DSM, yep. the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders written by the Australian, uh, the Australian, the American Psychiatric Association. 
Um, and, and there's a little paragraph at the front that says basically addiction is this really polemic word. It's quite severe and we use disorder usually instead. Mm -hmm. So even the word addiction in a psychiatric term isn't the go-to that we would use. Mm -hmm. um, I know it feels like for many people where they're young, you know, whether it's their partner or whether it's their child is really sucked in and hooked on devices or games. It can look like an addiction but when we really dig into that clinically it's probably something else it's probably not necessarily an addiction to the device but to each other all right mm -hmm. because if i said you know smartphone addiction is a really interesting one the phone itself isn't really what we're hankering for we need the internet connection and then we probably want the app that we're connecting with and if no one was on that app would we be interested in it? So it's actually our, you know, deep biological need to connect and be a part of something that plays into what we go looking for when, let's say, you know, with social media and smartphones and things like that, we're picking it up constantly. Mm -hmm. and, and we see that. We can't go without, you know, a few minutes without picking that up. In fact, if you go and get vaccinated at the this Olympic Park hub, they will send you um, a reminder and say, bring your smartphone to keep yourself in entertained in the observation section. Now, that is literally 15 minutes that rather than sitting with, mm -hmm. you know, ourselves and this moment in history and this incredible opportunity to be vaccinated, we're told bring your phone so you can kind of keep entertained. And that to me is a really interesting kind of um, problem. <laughs> and one point, like, don't be addicted to your phone. And the next thing, like, don't be alone with your thoughts. And that's coming from, you know, that, that high-end messaging. So mm. we're, we really have some work to do to turn this around um, and practice. Again, it's not necessarily about technology, but being with ourselves and being with our thoughts and being able to manage um, some of those, that discomfort and those mm. uncomfortable feelings. And actually, when, I, when you look at people, when you see how they are, inter they are just... No, well, it's really about attention, isn't it? Because attention is the currency of technology. Exactly. And we, we, there are some pretty expert people that know how to get our attention. Yes. And this is us in the sweet shop. We haven't quite worked that out yet. I mean, that is that is that addictive? You know, is our attention, our, our drive to us to make us engage constantly? Don't move Thank away from it. Yeah, look, I think what it is, is it's habit forming, whether that habit is addictive, or whether that habit forming is just a neural pathway where you become unconscious, and you go to do that. I think if I didn't have my phone with me, I wouldn't hanker for it, I would just take some time to readjust. So um, I had laser surgery many years ago, and I didn't need glasses for, you know, five or six years after. And for many years, I would still reach for my glasses because I had worn glasses since I was four. So was I addicted to my glasses? No, but I had a habit that was formed from picking up glasses every day. So again, I think we need to look at this in, in you know, your real question is, when does something become really problematic? Mm, yeah. And that's when it interferes with several domains of life. So when it's interfering with schoolwork or, or your job, when it's interfering with your ability to have relationships and connections with people in a meaningful way, when it's interfering with things like sleep and your, you know, basic functions, that's where we say, okay, this is interrupting your well-being. And, and that doesn't have to become, you know, seriously ingrained and your whole life falls apart. It can just be, I'm noticing that my relationship with my partner is not great because I've formed this habit of wanting to check in on my community in a kind of creepy, stalky way, not in a really adaptive, um, connected way. It's more a fear of missing out way, really, isn't it? That you yeah. might miss something really funny, critical, important. It's yeah. that. It's, it's really the fear of missing out, isn't it? Yeah, and again, the fear of missing out is made to seem like this bad thing, like, oh, you don't want to fear missing out. But part of wanting to be a, like the flip side of that is wanting to be connected, wanting yeah. to belong, wanting to have social capital, wanting to mean something to your community um, and needing to be in the, you know, the loop with the meme that's happening and being with the kind of trend is a way, I guess, in modern humans demonstrate their value to a group. It's not because, oh, look at me, I have skills to hunt and gather and keep us all alive. 
it's because I can make you laugh and I'm nice to be around. Yeah. Wow. I love your positive take on all this. Uh, you're not going to be drawn into anything too negative. That's okay. I mean, I'm okay with that. Yeah. But uh, it's interesting during this pandemic where we've been reminded, I mean, the plus side is it connects us. It Absolutely. connects us. But but the, the, the thing the pandemic has, I think, taught us is that that's not quite enough, really, is it? Well, the digital connection, obviously the way we communicate is very, very different to when there is a physical human with a beating heart in front of us. Mm. And, you know, most of my clients at the moment are choosing to safely come in and continue to have face-to-face because they know that telehealth isn't quite the same um, and that there's a benefit to creating the space and going somewhere to actually to see that person. So I think it does a good enough job and thank goodness that we have Mm, that now because, you know, SARS-1 when it happened in China, I mean, that was a really, really tricky time. There's lots of things that we could have learned from that. Um, But again, it's, it's kind of finding the blend of what works for you. And I didn't take a lot of my work into Zoom and to online spaces because I felt like everyone was just going to be exhausted. And the irony of learning about how to balance your digital life online in the middle of that stuff was just too much noise. So I pulled right back. Mm. Um, And and I think these are skills that we're learning as we go. um, And the emphasis definitely in the last few years has come to the forefront of our mind around what, you know, how our our hyperconnectivity is impacting us, is preying our well-being. And a lot of that's just how much information is out there, like how many people we're trying to keep up with. Our village is huge, yet not particularly useful. Like who would you call when, you know, you, I don't know, had a hangover or needed your kids picked up or all of those sorts of things. So really re-evaluating our relationships, I think, has been a big part of the pandemic. Mm. I, I, I picked out that date to 2007 because I know, and I'm sure you've read it too, is that work from Jonathan Haidt, The Coddling of the American Mind, yeah. and the impact that that's had on teenagers who were born, well, say they would, I think it was from, if they were 10 years old, by the time they were 2007, the science tells us they're struggling in many ways. And you use the term screenager, I think. I do, but that comes from an incredible researcher called Douglas Brushkoff. Okay. He first coined that in 1997 to talk about the generation of tech-savvy young people that would grow up with technology and TV. Okay. So um, Rushkoff is a prolific writer. Um, oh, he, he just blows my mind. He, um, I first came across his work when I was a commerce teacher and I used to show his CBS documentary, The Hunt for Cool. Um, he's written probably 20 books, does a kick-ass newsletter. He's one of, one of the newsletters I still let into my inbox. Um, so he was talking about screen ages way back then um, okay. and, and definitely hate and um, Gene Twenge and people like that. Um, we, we all kind of look at when did the iPhone come out and then the um, iPod and then the um, uh, tablets and things like that. And, yes, there are some correlations between uh, rises in mental health problems and the occurrence and uptake of those. There's lots of other ways we can correlate things to show you know, marginal effect sizes with those things. And again, you know, you need a a degree in statistics sometimes to be able to pick apart um, some of the ways that those statistical processes have been used. Um, So there is some cause for concern. Obviously, this is not about saying there's no impact. Um, We don't know what the impact is and we should exercise, you know, due caution when it comes to developing minds. So Mm. you only get one shot at really developing your brain regardless of how plastic we really think that is. And, of course, a very old saying is uh, show me the, let's make it gender neutral, show me the child at seven and I'll show you the adult. That's right. I know know it was show me the boy and I'll show you the man, but let's be... Came from the Jesuits. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But but that is, in fact, you know, those first seven years of development are incredibly important and gee I I mean I've witnessed in my own family I've got I've got grandchildren five three one you know when the five-year-old was put in front of a a screen for any length of time my goodness a bomb could have gone off somebody could have walked through the whole house 
uh, machine gunning everybody, and I doubt whether that child would have would have blinked an eyelid. Yeah. yeah. Scary. Is there research? And oh, there must be a lot of research out there showing the effect of screen time on under seven years. You know. Yeah, look, there is. It's really tricky. One of the biggest problems, I guess, that we face with this research is how we dose people with technology. It's not like you can really dose people with, you know, a vaccination did it stop that that particular disease. So one of the questions, I guess, and one of the issues is what are kids watching? And, you know, I go back to back in my day, there was um, uh, three or four TV channels and there was Sesame Street and you know, play school and things in the morning and the afternoon, or there was afternoon TV and morning cartoons. There wasn't 17 channels with 24-7 content and on-demand services. So the on-demand services make us quite demanding. My four-year-old will get up in the morning and say, I want TV, I want this show, I don't want that show, I want... That's like, oh, my gosh, and this is just TV. This is before she doesn't even know really where the iPad lives yet. Um, so there's lots of um, issues with how do we dose that and then, then how do we measure that because we as I guess the parents should be the gatekeepers of, of what young people are consuming and I guess I, one of my really big focuses at the moment are screens in early childhood mm. and, and really trying to delay um, access for as long as possible using that as a kind of top shelf distraction tool like once you've done all of the colouring and all of the, the physical stuff that you can do um, and then knowing what is the digitally nutritious um, kind of content to introduce and the different screens. So watching a, watching TV is quite different. My kid will watch TV but be playing and doing lots of other things to so having a screen right in your face yeah. while you go around the shopping centre rather than, you know, show me all the things that are green or let's look at the prices and start doing, you know, um, number recognition or something like that. So just those sorts of skills. Again, a lot of what I teach is much more about being present offline than it is about how to use technology. It's just reconnecting us to the, you know, the stuff beyond our, our screens. Mm. Well, um, I, I would definitely recommend ABC Kids as a good gatekeeper. For okay. If you had a choice of 17 different channels, I go straight to ABC Kids and feel, and I love sitting there actually and watching with the kids, the shows, some of them are fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Some of, could... some of them are fantastic. Very nutritious, I would suggest. Yes. Yes. Um, absolutely. ABC Kids, I think, has that more educationally vetted content. Um, when you get into some of the streaming services, there are all sorts of things that have beautiful, amazing graphics, but also mm. demonstrate some body image things. Some, some of the even PG shows have some really things that don't sit particularly well with me in terms of how friends become friends and mm. how they even solve problems and, and gender stuff. There's all sorts of um, issues. So you do kind of have to be on top of that and you do yeah. have to vet what young people are watching. Um, you know, I can recommend some great stuff. We could be here all day and just do an episode on, on what to Well, you've got, so you've got, on. I mean, your four-year-old is your youngest, I presume, is it? My one and only. One and only. Okay, okay. Because, uh, yeah, well, that's an interesting one because, uh, gee, I was sitting watching with my uh, granddaughter, Raya, the other day, which is a Pixar movie. Yeah, oh, yeah. it Raya was. And the Last Dragon. Yes, it was such a beautiful movie. I mean, yeah. I love watching, I love sitting with the kids and watching their kids' shows. And I think it's actually important to do that, yeah. to, to see what's happening. But, you know, back to us as, as a community, because I think we've all sat in our cars and abused people in a way that, God, if we ever faced them, we would just never do that. Mm -hmm. And I, th I know there's another term I've heard you use digital disinhibition effect. That's right. Yeah. What is what explain to us what that is? Basically, that's what happens when you're not actually looking at somebody. You're right? You're not having eye contact. So eye contact really kickstarts so much for us as humans. Mm. Um, the first thing our eyes are tuned to are two other eyeballs and two other circles, usually nipples because they're going to be the source of our food. So um, the digital disinhibition effect is really, really fascinating because basically what happens is we forget that there's actually another, you know, breathing human with a, you know, um, and the need for empathy, I guess, on the other side of a screen. So a few things happen is one, we get a bit bullshit and we get a bit out there with what we would say because it's not like I'm standing there saying it to you. 
We also then think that there's some level of anonymity. So we can hide in some online spaces behind a Twitter egg or, you know, a fake name. And then we can also curate what we're saying. So unlike having to have, you know, synchronous communication like we are now, I can sit back and I can think and I can kind of come up with something really nasty to say. Um, so that is sometimes why um, people get a little bit outraged and people complain in the online space in a way that they wouldn't if you actually had to go up to the, you know, restaurant owner and say, oh, actually my food wasn't very nice today or blah, blah, blah. So that's what's happening in that space. We, we, I think we also forget that there's real life consequences for our actions. And absolutely right now, I guess there's new legislation that says online abuse and harassment is actually illegal in Australia and you can be prosecuted for that. So that really brings that back home. It's not like the digital space is this wild west where nothing applies, but actually how you behave in that space is the same as how you would behave in real life. And that is law now? Absolutely, yeah. Wow, that's exciting to hear that. So if you have a look at the eSafety Commission, so we are very lucky in Australia to have an incredible office of the eSafety Commission, which started off just dealing with children about nearly six years ago. It's now, its powers have expanded and we now have new legislation that really looks at the um, impact of abuse, not just on minors, but on every single human in Australia who are using um, online spaces. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's encouraging. That's encouraging because um, it, it's not only us in the sweet shop, but it's the owner of the sweet shop learning yeah. how to regulate how much we can have and what, what we can have too. That's, that, that, that's yeah. catching up. Yeah. The other thing that I've heard you speak of are three M's. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I love that when I heard it. And I wonder, I was hoping you could share that with us as well. Tell us about the three M's. Sure. So the three M's of digital nutrition, I sort of say apply these before scrolling. It's mindful, meaningful and moderate. So mindful mm -hmm. in that you're really present, like you're not just sort of at the supermarket checkout, you know, scrolling through stuff that's really, you know, taking up space in your brain, but not being processed particularly well. So you're really present to what you're doing. I think mindfulness um, shows up in, in well-being everywhere. It's a really key skill. It's not all about, you know, sitting in a, in a cave and, and being a Buddha-style Buddha, Buddha style person. It's just being present to your emotions and um, how you're feeling. Uh, meaningful is all about it being aligned to your values. And, again, a values conversation is something that many psychologists will have with clients to talk about, well, what do you really care about? What, what is the stuff that matters to you? And are you living a life that's aligned to that? Because if you're out of alignment with those things, that's probably where you're having some difficulty. So that can mean things like um, just maybe unfollowing or muting accounts that aren't necessarily showing you the kinds of things that you want to be seeing. Maybe you're following celebrities because they were cool at one point, but you're not really kind of into their stuff anymore. Or following particular hashtags or people who are more aligned to the things that you care about. So some really great research has showed that when young people actually take some time to think about who they care about, what they what they want to do, so their jobs and the industry they want to be in and follow that, that has a positive impact on their mental health when they're using social media. So very different to some of the research that says all these kids are depressed and it's social media's fault. Um, and then moderate. Um, moderate is all about moderating, yes, the time that you use because even though we don't want to be obsessed with that, we still all only have 24 hours in the day. And yeah, we have different resources to, to use that. So Beyonce, that, that quote, Beyonce has 24 hours in the day, so do you. Yeah, Beyonce probably has a personal chef and doesn't do her own washing. It doesn't, you know. So we, but time is a limited resource. So we want to be careful of how much time we dedicate to the, these spaces. And we want to moderate how we respond based on that digital disinhibition effect. Are we being, you know, kind online? Are we speaking to people and responding in the same way that we would if that person was sitting across from us at the dinner table? So mm. they're the three M's. Wow, I love that. I mean, this, well, this, uh, this digital nutrition is overlapping with so much more about, I mean, um, mindfulness and meditation. Very, very positive. You know, me meaningful is part of what we talk about in our in this wellness program that we do when we talk about think and, and reference um, Martin Seligman's work of the PERMA model. Exactly, P that's where it comes from. P-E-R-M-A, the yeah. M is meaningful. Exactly. And, and moderate, it sounds like moderate or be moderate, you know, everything in moderation is what we right. used to hear be told. Yep. No, I love that. That's, that's really good. But to take the metaphor a little bit further, because you also 
talk about digital superfoods. Oh, yeah, that's kind of where I started, actually. So, um, look, I started looking at games and, and looking at, um, I guess, the way that games get a really bad rap and that there was a whole other world of games that kind of like there's a whole Australian film industry that maybe doesn't compete particularly well with Hollywood because it just doesn't have the big bucks and the big mm. studios. So similarly, there's this whole movement of games called Serious Games, um, well, Games for Change, I guess, is one of the main organisations that drives some of these things that really had beautiful narratives. They were much more pro-social. There were these really gorgeous little independent games. Um, and so I started talking about those as digital superfoods because of the way we connect, we problem solve, we collaborate, all of these different things that were happening in games. Um, so it's not just about saying, oh, playing Fortnite is fine, but there are actual ways to, to hack games like Fortnite so that you can, you know, connect and build skills and even learn languages. So we've seen young people teach themselves Danish so that they could play Minecraft. There's all sorts of really fascinating, positive things that are happening that we want to amplify while being, you know, conscious of some of those um, compelling and, and dependent sort of um, aspects of some game design. So, yeah, there's this fantastic um, database called taminggaming.com. I would really recommend that to families who are, I guess, stuck eating the digital hot chips of games. So the Minecraft Roblox um uh, Fortnite, those kinds of games uh, it's developed by a, a fantastic dad gamer called Andy Robertson in lockdown he, he put together this database and you can search it by age by um, the console that you're on um, accessibility features the, the style of game whether it's a persistent world or it's a one-off game all those different things so that you can discover all of these different games um, and play something that's, I guess, a little bit more digitally nutritious and diversify the digital diet away from, you know, the hot chips. Nice, nice. I love that. I love keeping coming back to that. I feel very comfortable with this. Um, now, you know, when we, as parents, you know, we often told lead by example, you know, oh, yeah. uh, modeling is another thing. You know, we talked about, we've talked about this with another psychologist, Jodie Lowinger, who, yeah. who's in the Sydney Anxiety Clinic. Mindset and she, method. Yes, well, she was talking about the importance of modelling, yeah. but it's probably more about do as I say, don't do as I do. Mm. Um, when you talk to families, uh, you know, how, how do you suggest to parents to for us all? Because this isn't just a kid problem. It's a whole community problem. How do we as a family, be it a nuclear family or a community family, mm -hmm. How do we deal with that? What's some advice, some strategies to navigate this? Well, there, you know, I don't want to sound like um, I'm pushing my course, but I have a course all for this, how to co-design your tech, family tech use agreement, because it is about co-designing with young people. Mm -hmm. if you really want to ignite change in your family. You have to collaborate and get kids on board. And you have to, I guess, depending on the age of your kids and the relationship that you might have, I really believe that having that 360 feedback is valuable because kids, you know, I don't believe in do as I say, not do as I do. And I don't think that's going to kind of no, stick no, for it's not a good way. modern kids, right? No, it's not, it's not a good way, but it is the way a lot of people are. <laughs> I remember my dad saying that very thing to me, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Over smoking. <laughs> yeah. So, um, look, I think it's really about um, talking about your values as a family, having regular conversations, and they're tough conversations and awkward conversations and things that teenagers especially think, oh, God, have you done a parenting course, Mum? Why are you talking to me about this stuff? But they build those bridges so that when the proverbial, if the proverbial hits the fan, kids feel comfortable coming to talk to their parents about what's going on. And the more that we have collaboration around things like the fact that we all put our devices away at 9.30, 10 o'clock, and no one is kind of being sucked into those porous boundaries between work and life. Um, I think then we all model well-being and we're all more connected. Um, many young people say to me, well, why should I get off my phone if mum and dad are still on their devices? And the cult of busyness and, and productivity and needing to be always on and constantly connected, I think is, I guess, one of the pushbacks from the pandemic where those boundaries are really porous. Like, are we living from work or working from home? Yeah. Um, and young people notice that. So for some of the kids that I work with, it's actually not about working with the kids. It's about working with the family dynamic, just like we would in eating disorders, because um, 
again, to use the analogy of food, it's something that we're all doing. And for some young people, their online worlds become the um, stand-in parent mm -hmm. because they don't have that attachment because everyone's in their devices doing their own thing. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that sits here. And I start with a course, um, 90 minutes to kind of give you some a sense of how to, these five steps of how to set up a new agreement. Again, it's not a contract. It's not something we sign up to. It's agreement that needs to be tweaked. And then I offer um, connected families coaching. So I take you sort of after you've done that course, I take you through a bit of a program and I, I guide you through some of those things for families where there might be learning difficulties, special needs, or, you know, the pointy end of those problems where getting off technology just becomes aggressive, problematic, you know, everything falls apart. So, yeah. Wow. Well, we'll definitely have links to that. And I mean, even if one was being proactive before a problem emerged, I mean, that sounds appealing. I, I think I'm going to sign our whole family up for that one, uh, Jocelyn. No, I'm being, ser I'm being really serious because we're all, you know, we're all guilty of it. And, uh, you know, I'm very aware with when you see young children of parents um, you know, advising their telling, put that away, put that away, you know, no, you're not going to. And then the next moment they're on their device and the kids saying, going, well, what the hell, you know? Yeah. And I think we have a different sense of what we can do these days as well. So it's like, well, don't be on your phone. Okay. Well, what do I do? I don't know. Go have fun. <laughs> yeah. Back in my day, I used to do blah, 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 playing cricket in the street or all that mm. stuff. So, you know, for many families, just letting your kid go to the park on their own, and this is some of, you know, Hate's work, Jonathan Hate's work is around that coddling. Mm. Um, we talk about the fact that, you know, kids are on screens more and that they're more, um, have higher rates of mental health, but they're also having less sex, going to less parties. They're not getting kidnapped as often. We actually live in a much safer society, yet we're behaving as if it's really scary out there. Mm. So there is that kind of um, uh, dissonance, I guess, between um, don't be on your phone, but we don't know what else you should be doing that we're comfortable with. Um, mm. And again, many, many parents don't actually know what their kids are doing online. They don't know the content of what they play. And the first home homework activity or home play activity I give to parents is go and play a game. Mm. And if you're too busy to play a game for 20 minutes with your kid, you probably need to go and play for an hour. Yes, so. because it's not, it is also, I mean, things that kids are exposed to on the internet um, are quite frightening in many ways uh, be, about yeah. about pornography, a whole sense of intimacy, expectation. I mean, this is why being proactive in this space is it's actually not a not an alternative. I think it's almost mandatory, isn't it? Really, I believe so. I, I think we have got a lot of work to do with understanding that when you allow your child to go online, it's kind of like handing over the keys to the family car. Mm. You wouldn't do that to an eight-year-old just because they'd seen you drive. Mm. There are very clear ways that we scaffold people into learning to drive in this country um, and, you know, different states around Australia. So we need to think of it that way. And if we don't go, I guess, with the food analogy, we can, we can go with the driving analogy that, there needs to be that, um, you know, learner driver, L plates, P plates, gathering the ability to demonstrate that you actually can be safe in that space, knowing that you can never mitigate every single risk. You can be a really safe driver. It doesn't mean that, you know, the semi-trailer coming your way is also a, a safe driver doing the right thing. Um, and again, we, we kind of need to be in conversation so that, you know, one of the biggest things that young people are worried about when um, things go wrong in digital spaces is if they tell their parents, their parents will take the device away. Mm. And having their device taken away is like having the family dog put down for some of them. It's just, you know, really, really painful reality. So they don't tell their parents about the little stuff. And then it turns into big stuff. And so I've heard kids say, oh, I didn't want to tell mum about that because I swore in a message to somebody and I didn't want her to see that I'd use the F word or the C word or whatever word. And so in their little underdeveloped frames, they're like, I'm going to get in trouble with the swearing. I don't want my phone taken away. Whereas we don't care really if you're swearing. We care whether you're watching pornography or there's an online predator lining up to meet you after school. So again, this is kind of one little example of why we really do need to not handhold or mollycoddle, but be very cognizant of the risks 
and not kind of pretend that it's not going to happen, but equip kids for how to manage when that happens. Um, Porn is one thing. I mean, you know, the risk of people live streaming really inappropriate material and it being virally spread is another thing that happens, unfortunately, way too often. Um, there's, there's all sorts of things which I guess sit in the digital safety space a little bit more than my digital wellbeing space, but increasingly that overlap and it's hard to pull one out without the other. Um, you know, it's just part of that territory um, and part of like why we, we teach young people to defensively drive and drive in the rain and drive in the dark and all of those things. We need to think of it that way. Mm -hmm. Gosh, I mean, there is just so much to think about, but very reassuring, Jocelyn, to know this, this is a course that you do provide because, as I say, I think being proactive about it is is the only alternative, really. It's the best alternative. Listen, um, I just wanted to just finish up now and sort of take a step back from your role as a, as a, the chef of digital nutrition um, and a psychologist because we're all on a health journey together through life in this modern world. And I wonder whether you might think about what, what do you think the biggest challenge is for an individual on that journey? Yeah, look, I think it's consistency and applying what we know. Yeah. Right, interesting. So, Go on. Yeah, look, I think that the, like we were saying before, lots of information and, and we kind of know a lot, but are we applying what we know? And I guess if everyone applied what they knew about health and well-being, I probably wouldn't have a job as a psychologist. <laughs> right? Yes, um, of course. And then when we learn, so part of what I offer in that course and, and most of my work is a booster session because, you can then learn the five steps and have the 38 page workbook. And, but if you don't try it and then try it again and review it and keep tweaking it and keep working towards it and getting that consistency, then we're probably not going anywhere. So for me, the, the biggest thing that I want to know is two weeks or two months after you see me speak or present or come to a course with me is what changed and what stopped you from changing so that I can kind of give you that boost to kickstart and, and remember all of the things um, that you do know. Like, we, we know a lot as humans. Um, we're just not probably applying it. Well, Jocelyn, I th th thank you so much for today. It's been terrific to talk to you and on a subject that literally affects us all. Um, and we'll, of course, have links to that wonderful course you mentioned. Thank you so much. Well, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ron. Well, I think you can see what I was drawn to uh, in so looking forward to my conversation with Jocelyn. Um, what attracted my attention, of course, was digital nutrition and digital detox and digital superfoods and the uh, metaphors around nutrition, but uh, also the fact that, look, let's face it, we are all, there's, it's all a huge challenge. We walk around with these things in our hands that give us access to the world. I heard one description um, to put it into perspective, which said that a Maasai tribesman in the middle of the Kalahari desert with reception and a, uh, and a smartphone has access to more information in 2021 than President Clinton had in the White House in, in the 90s. And, um, you know, I think uh, that is uh, a sobering thought. And when you think that, Everybody does. I mean, when children hold a phone or have a device, they have access and there are many things they can be exposed to. Um, we all uh, can be distracted. I mean, I know personally, I have just switched off all my notifications, apart from messages from family and my phone calls. Um, and, uh, and, and I can only imagine if you have still got notifications on for Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, the Sydney Morning Herald, The Guardian, The New York Times, uh, whatever. It wouldn't be hard for you to have uh, to accept the default position of every app you have on your mobile phone, which is to allow push notifications. And if that is you, a very simple way of transforming your life is to switch all those not push notifications off or be at least far more selective about what they are. Look, it's a challenge for us all, and I'm certainly going to be doing Jocelyn's course and encouraging my entire family um, to do that as well. I think this is something that we have to be really open and honest and collaborative with our 
young children about from almost from the time they can talk. Maybe that's a little bit um, too early, but certainly uh, I would think from the age of five, um, I, I would want to be sitting down with my children or grandchildren and talking openly and honestly about the digital world. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think that you've got to be proactive and that's part of what this is all about. And I, and I loved um, Jocelyn's two points of consistency and apply what we know, consistency, um, being consistent. And that's a theme that keeps coming up when we talk, when we talk about sleep as well, being routine having a routine. When we're talking about food, we, have a, 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 we had a discussion with Dr. Pran Yoganathan, who, who mentioned that the variety wasn't everything it was cracked up to be. Maybe consistency in our diet is a good thing too. And consistency in how we approach technology. Look, there's something we've, re I've referenced this before, there's something wonderfully consistent about the sun coming up every day and going down every night that drives the world around. And so there's nothing wrong with consistency. Um, I think that's a very powerful thing. And what about applying what we know? Boy, wouldn't we, we all be better if we applied what we know consistently. Anyway, we'll have links to Jocelyn's site, Jocelyn's course. Um, I, I, I will certainly be doing it as I mentioned. Look, we've got some exciting things happening. We've uh, already had and will continue to have some live Instagram TV. I'm just uh, really excited about that. We're going to be launching our online wellness program and, uh, and we're going to have a subscription as well, which will give you access to so much more than even you have access to at the moment. I hope this finds you well. Until next time, this is Dr. Ron Early. Be well. This podcast provides general information and discussion about medicine, health and related subjects content is not intended and should not be construed as medical advice or as a substitute for care by a qualified medical practitioner. If you or any other person has a medical concern, he or she should consult with an appropriately qualified medical practitioner. Guests who speak in this podcast express their own opinions, experiences and conclusions.